Welcome, Peter. Welcome. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. So, good afternoon, and thank you for the pleasure of um, talking about our work with you. Um, it's not all about light, um, and there's an odd connection here, which we didn't really expect. Um, Lucinda's here as part of the team. We had a team of people working on this, as Martin said. It takes a lot of people to make not much progress sometimes. <laughs> but Martin was involved in 2007. We had a workshop where we got lots of um, scent specialists together, and um, the whole effort I'm going to talk about started then. We started to expand our horizons about what was important, and, um, and it, it led in some interesting directions, mainly to do with schools, and I'm going to use evidence from schools um, to make a few points, um, but we think the implications are much broader than that. So, the physical environment, does it matter? We all think it does. I'm a construction person, I'm bound to think it does, and we sort of assume it does, and intuitively, as People we know, if we go into different spaces, we have a different reaction. Um, we may be uplifted in a cathedral or something. We may be excited in a theater. So you sort of know it, but actually, it's really hard to evidence it. And so um, I'm going to point you to the thing that everybody in the UK looks at in relation to schools, which is the Education Endowment Foundation Trust, who are the collectors of what is sound evidence for what works in schools. And they say about the physical environment that it has very little effect and there's not really any evidence for it. Now, I'm telling you, this is the thing that teachers look at, the government looks at, everybody looks at. And so it's a real shock. It's a shock for me. Um, we've done our study, so I'm really annoyed, actually. But they say they only do meta-studies, so they need more than one to look at. <laughs> so they're, they're not changing it until there's more than one study. Um, but I'm sounding critical. But in a way, um, they've got a point that there are lots of bits of evidence, quasi-regularities, whatever you want to call them, about particular aspects, and there isn't really very much evidence about the effect of the whole built environment as we experience it, which isn't light, which isn't sound, which isn't all the bits. It's the whole experience of space. And there's very little evidence about that. So that was what we were working on, I suppose. And we're talking about implementation in a way, and in a way, the problem of implementation is a generic one, that actually um, we're doing studies of the parts of the problems, and then we're asking people to create whole things made up of lots of aspects. And um, our first speaker said, there's theory and then there's practice. And I thought, yeah, you're right, <laughs> that's exactly it. And there's a gap in between them. And the gap is in theory, and the gap is in practice. It's in both aspects. It's very, very difficult to actually um, move from specialist areas where the complexity has been reduced and there are really deep studies into broader areas where everything's interacting. And in fact, um, the way we've typified it is like this. There are different sorts of research. I can't spend long on this because this is a complicated area in its own right. But on the left-hand side, you've got laboratory studies where you just get rid of the complexity and study one variable, ideally, in science. On the right-hand side, you've got um, stuff going on in what I used to call the real world, but the laboratory people said their world's real as well, so <laughs> I've stopped saying that. So you're right, two real worlds. Why can't you move from the left to the right? And you know, it's why can't microeconomics turn into macroeconomics? Well, it patently can't. Um, and it's because of the complexity. It's because of the multiplier effect of all of those aspects which become just too difficult to handle. And so in social science, there's an answer to this, which is in the middle there, telescopic studies, where you have to go up a level of resolution. You have to actually do a thing called retroduction, which is start to make guesses about the broad elements that may be important. And they're informed by the detailed studies in the lab, and they're tested by the experience in the real wide world on the right-hand side. And so that's a proposition that to solve this problem, you don't do more and more detailed stuff. You don't do more and more connections. Of course, where you can model things, it's fine. But there are real limits to how far you can go on that. So rather than just jump to, and the architect will work it out somehow, because they've got really good creative skills, um, another way is to say, well, are there models of how we experience space that would help us determine at a broad level the types of things we should take into account? So that's what we tried to do. Um, and it was a simple thought experiment. 
We got really confused after 2007 when Martine and all the other specialists came along <laughs> and um, gave us lots of information, and it was almost too hard to do. So um, we ended up taking a very simple stance, which is what happens if you're a person in a space and everything's coming through your senses? The first thing is that's how you experience the space, through all of your senses. And the second thing is that actually the overall impact is what your brain calculates is going on around you. So it's to do with neuroscience, it's to do with the interpretation of all that sense data. And that was the sort of thing we were talking about in 2007. And the guy from the Salk Institute, who was a neuroscientist, said, I can't help you. I can measure what's going on in your brain and where, but actually there's too much going on. It's an ill-posed problem. It's an intuitive response in the end. So we moved on from that, because that was quite an interesting finding, that actually it's not a rational calculation when you're in a space. It's more a reaction, particularly if you're going to do what we did, which is say, what's the effect of a space over a whole year, the ambient effect of its characteristics? Um, so we came up with what we've ended up calling the SIN paradigm. Um, and this is a range of factors which, working from um, the detailed information about evidenced impacts on people in spaces, linking them through some sort of overarching model driven by how we experience stuff through our senses, we came up with three broad categories. And the first category is very familiar. It's naturalness things. It's heat, light, sound, air quality, that type of thing. And, you know, that, that's, that's to be expected, I suppose. And that's because our brains expect and like natural, healthy conditions and respond well to those. So that's fine. That's in the literature. But we then added in some other things. Um, we're also individuals, and our brains learn to like different things and respond differently in spaces. And so we put a category called individualization in. And I'll come on to what, how we interpreted these in a while. And the third one is level of stimulation. We actually potentially need different levels of stimulation for different situations. You know, we might want to be excited or we might want to be calm, but it affects how we are actually feeling in a general sense. And so we put a level of stimulation in. So this was 2010, complete speculation that these are the types of things we should take into account. And even though some of them are hard to measure, unlike the naturalness things, um, we were going to include them anyway because we thought they were important, even though they're hard to measure. So the level of stimulation is quite hard to measure. So we took this model, and um, we got funding for a project in 2012, um, which was to look at schools. And this is primary schools, small children, brilliant natural experiment for us, because these poor kids are stuck in the same classroom for pretty much a whole year, and they measure how they're doing academically at the start, and they measure how they've done academically at the end. So it actually gives us a chance to link to a real sort of important factor in the educational scene um, that affects humans, a performance measure, if you like, which is very hard to do on productivity in offices, quite hard to do on getting better in hospitals. Um, so we had a me metric of human performance, and we had a situation where the exposure to the environments was a whole year in the same place. So it's a good situation, if there was an effect, to find it. Big sample, um, so this was a project which took 12 person years to do. Um, so it's a big study, um, 3,766 pupils. We knew information on each of those in terms of academic progress and also whether they were from disadvantaged backgrounds, whether they were, had English as an additional language um, and whether they were SEN, special educational needs. So we knew a lot about the individual pupils. We knew which space they were in. We measured in detail 153 classrooms and so we could make a connection between those. And then we were able to, and we looked at diversity. We went for as diverse a sample as we could get, all different ages of um, buildings. This is a bit like a massive POE exercise, to be honest. And then we set up a situation where we use those SIN factors on the right-hand side, and we had the data on the progress of the children going up through the center. We put the pupil right in the center of the diagram. This is what we're saying. The person has to be in the center. It's they who are experiencing the space. Um, and we could do multi-level modelling. So we've made this much more complicated by putting lots of factors in. The multi-level modelling enabled us to strip out the things that were happening at the level of the school, compared with the classroom, compared with the individual child. So it's a neat solution for built environment research, actually. So what do we find? Well, we did lots of analysis. It took a hell of a long while. But then what we found out of that was that we could actually find connections between the different things we were measuring in physical space and their, connect and their linkage to progress in learning over the year, in reading, writing, and maths. We took the average. Um, and so these, the things I'm going to talk about are directly linked through evidence to progress in learning amongst primary school children. 
And this is what it looked like, because you can start to predict from the model. So 153 classrooms, each of those columns is a school. We looked at about six classrooms in each school. And you can see there's a lot of variation in amongst um, the influence of those classrooms on what would be an average child if there was such a thing. We just made everything one, basically. And the performance is up the left-hand side. And you can see, if you take the extreme case, I'm going to give you the proper answer in a moment, but the extreme case is really quite shocking. So if you take this average child in the worst space compared with the best space, um, you would, and you move them from the worst to the best, you would expect the impact of that to be 1.3 sub-levels of progress, which in UK speak is massive, because a child is expected to make two sub-levels progress in a year. So we're talking about a huge effect at the extreme. I know it's the extreme, but we're talking about if you were actually in a really horrible, dark, stuffy, um, damp classroom, and you went into a perfect classroom, what would the effect be? It is huge, and we sort of know that, but this is the sort of evidence for it. The generic answer, rather than the extreme one, is that the variation in the characteristics of the spaces explains 16% of the variation of the um, progress the children made in learning over the year. So this is actually quite big. I heard somebody say if it was 1%, that would be really important. I thought this was my fallback position if this project didn't produce very big numbers. I was going to say 1% over decades with thousands of kids. Well, we don't need to make that argument. 16% is of about the same order as the variation in teaching quality makes. That's, that's estimated to be between 8 and 24%. 24%. So we're saying this is a huge effect. And we think it's a huge effect because it's largely unrecognized and unmanaged, unlike teachers. So these factors are things that people just are blind to. And they vary really, really widely amongst the sample that we looked at. And in doing this, we've taken out the effect of the individual child. We've taken out the effect of um, the teacher, actually. They're the unexplained part at the classroom level. So we really do know that this is the effect that goes with the characteristics of the physical classroom. One of the unexpected findings was that we didn't find a school level um, we didn't find that the school level factors were significant. So what this is saying is there aren't good and bad schools, there are good and bad classrooms. The level of analysis needs to be at the level of the space rather than at the level of the building. It's quite a significant thing, especially for designers, I guess. So one of the reasons is that the variation within the schools is huge. So you really do get very poor and very good classrooms within the same school, often because of orientation or the way the classroom's been used by the teachers. Um, and so you have to basically do inside-out design. You have to start with classrooms that all work really well, and then you put them together into a school that works really well. So here's the interesting bit, I suppose. We know this 16% impact on, on learning, explaining the variations in learning. Um, how does it pan out amongst the various factors? Well, these are the factors that came out as being um, significant in the multi-level analysis. You can see there are seven. Um, light, temperature, air quality are the naturalness ones. And luckily for this conference, <laughs> this is a four. <laughs> light, <laughs> light comes out as the biggest of seven. So we're talking about 21% of that 16% is explained by light. Um, and interestingly, do you remember the others, the level of stimulation, the individualization with speculations? They together explain 51% of the variation. So they're actually as important, if not marginally more important, than the naturalness ones. And so that speculation about what might be important um, beyond just the normal big four things that people measure turned out to be actually really quite significant. I'm going to go quickly now. Lots of people have talked about lighting, so I don't need to say much, except more isn't better. I mean, that's obvious. You've got a lot of experts here. Um, if you have too much glare, that's problematic. Um, and if you actually put the blinds down and don't take them up, that's problematic. There's all sorts of behavioral things. And you can see there's cupboards stacked on the right-hand side there against the windows because the teachers aren't realizing that actually it's really important. But you also need good artificial lighting as well. Um, not many classrooms would never need artificial lighting at some time of the year or at some time of the day. Um, and good and easy to operate blinds, that sort of thing. It's got to be something that works in practice. So I'm not going to say much more about lighting, apart from we've said it's the biggest of the seven factors. Um, but it makes you think windows matter a lot. So we're talking about windows as how light gets in. The second biggest factor, I think it was, is ventilation. And this is a school monitored over seven days in the UK, just as an example. Um, you can see Saturday and Sunday at the bottom are brilliant. 
nobody in there, beautiful, beautiful air quality. Um, but during the day, should, shouldn't really be much over 1,000, and you're up to over 2,000 in the middle of the day regularly, for pre pre pretty much every day of the week. And so air quality, massively important, direct influence on learning rates, needs to be considered alongside light, windows is where that comes together. Views of nature dropped out of our analysis when we looked at all three subjects, but when we looked just at writing, it reappeared. So, I mean, there's a speculation that writing is a creative process and creativity and links to nature is something the literature goes on about. So we suspect there's something going on there. We've recently done a study of girls' schools and one of the girls and then the group of girls said to us, and when I'm trying to do writing and I'm trying to imagine things, I need to look out the window and then it all starts to... And we thought, you'd see, and just what we were guessing. <laughs> and so it's obviously true. <laughs> light, light, of course, is closely related to colour and... Um, one of the things we looked at was level of stimulation. That was a quarter of the influence. And um, it wasn't known whether really bright, stimulating classrooms or really dull, boring ones, I'm using colour words here, um, were optimal. It turns out somewhere in the middle. A calm backdrop with points of light, that, or points of colour, sorry, that actually brings that about. So we're talking about using colour as a stimulant as well. So what I would say is that, yes, um, light is very important. It is the biggest single factor, but so too is ventilation, so too is colour, so too are all the other factors there. And some of them are really quite um, unusual, like individualisation, personalisation of the spaces, which for maths is a huge factor, isn't to do with light. So what would I say? I'd say light is necessary, but not sufficient. Of course, it's hugely important, but it's not the whole story. And when we're designing and when we're looking at these factors, we need to actually take a broad view. And a holistic, human, sinful perspective maybe helps us do that. And it scales and evidences the impact of light. So light does come out as massively important. But it contextualizes it and says, when you're dealing with light, don't accidentally mess up these other things. And it also, I suppose, is more convincing in some ways. We're not looking at light, it just came out. We're not zealous about light per se, but it actually does come out as being important. And I think that is actually more compelling, I guess. And what's more, it enables you to try and bridge that gap, the gap between the parts and the holes. This, this model, this SIN model, says when you're a designer, think about naturalness, but think about the level of stimulation, think about the individualization of the space. Those are actually design principles that you can take into account. And if you do that, clients should want it because it affects learning. And the teaching professions have been um, very interested in this and, um, and actually picking up our results very strongly. In relation to standards, this is my last point, I would say um, CSTB in France years ago was talking about standards of the whole space rather than standards for the individual parts. That would be an interesting direction to follow. They see everything as electromagnetic radiation, so why shouldn't you? I mean, it's, it's sort of an argument. But what I would say is light, very important, but see it in a context, and I'd be interested in feedback on the, the SIN model and the sort of factors that we try and take into account, given that we have the evidence that they do make a real impact. Thank you very much.